The Hague. Well, let's discuss this a bit more. We're joined now by Faisal Itani. He's a fellow with the Atlantic Council's Rafiq Hariri Center for the Middle East. He joins us now live from Washington. Faisal, so um, if these four men, these suspects, have been identified, people know who they are, why have they not been apprehended? Well, simply put, the Lebanese state institutions are too divided and too weak to have the political will to go after them. Of course, these men are, uh, enjoy the protection of Hezbollah, uh, and going after them would also would most likely require a violent confrontation and that's something the security forces also have no appetite for and arguably little capability to do. I mean could the authorities if they wanted to actually go in the Hezbollah, Hezbollah run areas and arrest these men I mean could they actually do it? Probably not uh, given the balance of power within the Lebanon between the security forces and Hezbollah. Also bear in mind that uh, the security forces themselves are multi-sectarian, made up of a significant quantity of Hezbollah sympathizers, and they, their cohesiveness would come under great pressure were they to, to confront Hezbollah violently. Okay, I mean, so it sounds like you, you don't really think that these men, these suspects, will ever really be brought to justice? Look, I mean, I, I think whether or not they're brought to justice uh, depends very much on Hezbollah's security and political posture within Lebanon and uh, the uh, stance and situation of its allies abroad, the Syrian regime uh, and Iran, both of which have been quite steadfastly behind Hezbollah up till now, Other, outside of a scenario that shifts their, their uh, foreign support as well as their domestic military capability, I don't see a scenario where they'd be coercively brought to justice. No. Um is there an element, perhaps, that uh, if they ever were arrested, it would cause such um, instability between Hezbollah and the central government, the central authorities, in some way, that really the interests of stability have to trump the interests of justice? I wouldn't quite put it that way, because I think uh, you have to bear in mind Hezbollah is a significant player within the official institutions of Lebanon itself and exercises enough uh, power there to actually basically preempt or uh, derail any official efforts to go after them. Opposition to Hezbollah would have to come directly from its political rivals within Lebanon itself. So I think it's just a, it's a question of really the impossibility of the task mm. rather than the risk that would, uh, it, that would uh, come up to political stability as such. So when Rafiq Hariri's son, Saad Hariri, says we're going to find out the truth about uh, my father's assassination, uh, that's wishful thinking on his part? Not necessarily. I think, uh, I mean, uh, if the accusations are accurate and the culpability is established in, uh, in a court of law, an international tribunal of this sort, he may well find out uh, what, what happened at least at the execution level uh, of the assassination. Mm. I don't think really the, the difficulty is not so much uncovering what happened as doing something significant about it. And how important is all this now, do you think, generally to the kind of uh, the wider population in Lebanon today? I think it's quite important. I mean, uh, a significant portion of the Lebanese have rejected its, its legitimacy outright, uh, mostly the supporters of Hezbollah and, and their sympathizers. But uh, to many of them, I think this is quite unprecedented that uh, a political assassination in Lebanon, which are quite common occurrence and never gets tried or uh, prosecuted, is for the first time achieving this level of visibility and getting this level of scrutiny. But I think it's an important precedent, but we're not quite at a situation where we can implement its uh, findings. And I just want to ask you very quickly, uh, Faisal, we've just had in the past few minutes the U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry calling on the Syrian opposition coalition, which is due to meet on Friday, that they should vote in favour of attending the scheduled Geneva Talk 2 peace conference, which is, of course, scheduled for next week. And we know, of course, that there's a great deal of opposition amongst Syria's divided opposition. Sorry to put you on the spot, but just give us your reaction on that, on what John Kerry um, has just been urging the, the Syrian opposition coalition to attend the talks. I mean, given how much emphasis U.S. policy has placed on uh, the Geneva talks, I can totally understand why he would take that position. But from the perspective of the opposition coalition he's speaking to, they have two problems. Firstly, that they don't really have a significant support within Syria itself and are not seen as empowered to negotiate on Syrians' behalf uh, at, at Geneva. And secondly, that uh, many of the more important rebel forces within Syria itself, who actually do have a lot of decisive influence over events, 
have outright rejected the Geneva process and threatened to see anybody that participates in it as a traitor. So really they're in an impossible position. If they do refuse to go, on the other hand, they will lose whatever nominal U.S. support they've enjoyed so far, which admittedly hasn't been much. Okay, Faisal Attorney, thank you very much indeed for that quick response there on that unscheduled statement on Syria which the US Secretary of State John Kerry has just made. And a suicide